good evening and welcome here in the studio and in our live stream. Welcome to our guest students from the University of Applied Sciences St. Pölten and Babesbury Eye University. Welcome to everyone who is watching us. We are Elisabeth and Lisa and we warmly welcome you here to Media Tech Space. We are so glad that you are here. All this week on campus, we've had an international immersive week. There are students from six countries, from Romania, Sweden, Ukraine, Peru, Austria and Germany, who are working together with our students and professors from the Faculty of Media. They have been joining workshops and creating 360 degree films. Thank you for the International Office and Erasmus for making this possible. Exciting keynotes on the subject of immersive media await you tonight. We have invited three exciting speakers who will tell you a little bit more about Immersive Experience Lab, Mixed Reality in Industry 4.0, and 360 degree storytelling. If there are any questions in the audience or on our social media, feel free to write them in our YouTube stream chat or save them for later and ask them here directly in the studio. Of course, to make our event more impressive, we have invited a singer from Romania and a band from Leipzig. You will hear them. They will accompany us tonight. Every year in November, we, students from the University of Applied Sciences Medweida, organize a media congress to speak about the media world and the latest media trends to understand how fast the media field is changing. Although the Media Forum Medweida 2022 will only take place on 23rd and 24th of November, we could hardly wait until our event, so we decided to join this immersive week. We organized Media Tech Space as a little pre-event and a little insight into what you can expect from us in fall. Spotify, Sky, Netflix, Google and TikTok, they have all been with us. This year, the experts of the media industry will meet again in the heart of Midvida. You want to exchange ideas with the most innovative minds in the media world and get inspired by powerful talks? <laughs> then come to the TV studio at Midvida University of Applied Sciences. In our panels, you will get exclusive insights into the most important industries and the latest super trends, which you should not miss. You want to prove your skills in action and learn from the best? Then our workshops are the right place to be. And don't forget our recruiting launch, where you will get the unique opportunity to get to know your favorite companies in the job market and secure an internship. Mark the 23rd and 24th of November in your calendar for the Median Forum mit Weida 2022. Join us. We are looking forward to meeting you. The first, the first speaker is a professor from Technica University Dresden of the Faculty of Computer Science. His interests and in teaching interests span various aspects of immersive media such as applications of virtual and augmented reality in data visualization, education, and the creative arts. Particularly, he has been very active in a lab of Technical University Dresden. This immersive experience lab conducts interdisciplinary research into the foundations, technology, applications, and implications of immersive media. Media in which virtual and remote people, objects, events, or worlds are experienced as real and present. This evening, he will tell you more about his recent project. On our screens, a professor from Technical University Dresden, all the way from London, Paris, Sydney, and Berlin. Please, big round of applause, Matthew McGinnity. <laughs> That's quite a first. Thank you very much. Um, you've done some of my work for me too. My first, the first parts of my talk are just to introduce myself, but I don't have to do that anymore. Um, 
Hello everyone from Dresden. Um, I'll give a little intro to some of the work we do in our lab today. Um, uh, see how we go in the little time we have. And I'll try and explain some of the different experiments and projects that we're working on. Now, together um, and we've been here for two years. Uh, prior to that I worked in different universities and, and places um, as, the, as was mentioned um, in the University in Sydney and also at places like the ZKM in Karlsruhe. Now at our lab we've devoted ourselves to the study of immersive systems um, so I should start by quickly defining that very briefly. Um, remote, virtual, or fictional that in some way resembles, in some way resembles the experience you would have were these things real and present. So I, I won't go, don't worry, this, this talk won't be too technical, but it's, I think it's important to just start with this because most of the time when people talk about virtual reality, they begin by thinking about the technology first, helmets, things like this. Um, but what's important to note with this is this definition does not dictate any particular technology. In fact, it might not even use computers. Um, and in fact, some of the things that we study or we talk about are you know, pre-computer immersive medium, um, like the wonderful panoramas of the 18th century. So that's one thing to note. And the second thing, just to be clear, we're not talking about um, you believing that things are real. So it's not this, we're just saying some aspect of your experience is somehow resembles this. And we're also, um, it, we're not talking about recreating necessarily the real world. So this may also be applied to completely fictional worlds. Um, so let's see where we get from this. Um, some of the systems we've used to give you an idea of the diverse technologies um, in the past, we've worked with big panoramic projection systems like this one, uh, which give you a stereoscopic kind of panoramic view um, that, which you can't see in this image here, but when you're standing inside this thing, the, these, uh, you have a real experience of space and distance. Things are blasted out into three dimensions. Um, and with this system over the years in Sydney, we developed many applications such as um, training simulations for under underground coal miners. You can see them here working as a team and navigating through a, um, a virtual replica of a coal mine. Um, so this will give you an idea of the types of technology we've used. And more recently we, we use, we turn also to these new head mounted displays that are, um, have finally become um, you know, usable in a, in a way. Um, and this is an example of a project um, by a, a recent student of ours who built a, um, a full body um, kind of laboratory for exploring different ways of changing your, your appearance. Um, so what we have here is um, full body tracking and then a kind of an avatar. And then he explored different interfaces for painting yourself with different materials. Let's see if I can get the, to skip forward. And this gives you an idea of the kinds of things we're working on at the moment. And here he is manipulating his body like this. Now, it should be also added that we don't work just with vision. So we're also very interested in sound as well. Um, so one of the techniques we use, which we, 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 um, we borrowed from and George Miller, George Burris Miller, where they, um, they developed a technique of recording with special binaural microphones. Either you put the microphones in your ear or you use a microphone with artificial ears. And this has the effect of capturing all the, uh, let's say the acoustic cues that are provided by these funny shaped things on the side of your head. 
Um, now, what we've discovered, um, well, what Janet Cardiff discovered is something quite wonderful, is that if you listen to these recordings in precisely the place you made them, then it becomes quite difficult to tell what is used, quite a low, kind of low-tech approach, but we're able to achieve a kind of a, a fidelity of realism that you just could not achieve with vision at the moment. So head-mounted displays, things like this, are not able to fool you to the degree where you, not yet, not quite, where you, you can't tell if something is real or not. But if we, if we work just with audio, we can start to achieve these kinds of levels of immersion. We also work with touch, and this is an example of a kind of experiment where we're exploring the interrelationship between vision and touch. Um, and we're exploring why it is, um, in this particular case, what it is most important about um, when you touch something, when you see the visual cue, if it aligns or not. It's quite interesting, actually, I should comment on this. One of the most peculiar things about virtual reality especially in the state in the last few years, is that you're more, most of the time invisible. We can't see your body, We, um, which is something I guess we would have all dreamed to experience for a long time. And so, you know, what, what would it feel like if you could not see yourself? And it turns out that it's quite unsettling. It's, has a, it has a disorientating effect. And more than this, it seems to have a, an effect where when you touch things, but you can't see the hand that's doing the touching, um, you don't really feel like you're seeing the thing that you're touching also. There's, a, there's things. How to glue your, your touch and vision together. And these are other experiments where we work with audio. These are sound speakers and we can play sounds around the room. And then using a head mounted display, we can give you different stimuli. Um, and then we measure the effect that the stimuli has on your perception of where the sound comes from. Now, one of the things that kind of emerges from all these experiments, I guess why we do these experiments, is we're kind of interested in the bigger question of why it is that some things are perceived as, as having a certain realness and other things aren't. This is the essential question. We want to understand what kinds of fictional things can we experience in these virtual worlds? Can we experience anything as real um, or not? And if you look, for example, at these two pictures of elephants, you'll see that while this one on the left is a quite, let's say, realistic rendering of an elephant in terms of what you believe about elephants, the one on the right is also realistic, but not in terms of what do you know about elephants, but in terms of perception. And we're leaning more to the direction that in virtual reality and all this immersion is purely about perception and not about belief. It doesn't matter what you believe about the world, it's how the, the low level cues. So these are the kinds of things that we're trying to study and we're trying to un understand the relationship between these things. Um, and one of the theories that we study is that the most important thing is that all your perceptual cues agree with one another. This is, this is the thing we're finding. So our, our theory is mostly based on the idea of congruence, that the, the stimuli that you receive agrees with each other. Um, these are examples of images that are generated by um, neural networks. And here, these are good examples of things that have a certain realness but no cognitive realness. In other words, you cannot recognize these objects and you cannot identify any objects in these images, but they have a certain realness. And, because that, and this is because they have a certain low level perceptual congruence. So this is the kind of thing we're investigating. So to do this, we're doing some experiments right now where we are able to recreate, reconstruct a real room so what you're seeing now is, um, maybe I should explain this just for a second. The, 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 the new head mounted displays have cameras on them. So you can see the real world, but the real world that you see is black and white and gray because the cameras are only black and white at the moment. Um, but what we found is for some reason, even though these images are black and white and grainy, you trust that you're seeing the real world. 
And we want to understand why it is that you trust that that's the real world. And here, what we've done to unpack this is we've made a virtual copy of the real world. And what you're seeing now is transitioning between the real world and the virtual copy. And it's more or less impossible to distinguish between the two. You'll see a little bit here that the bed, the bed covers move because um, <laughs> we were unable to keep the room exactly the same for so many months. And so these are some of the apparatus we're using to study this. Now, we're also interested in our lab in uh, applications. And so the, the, I've given you some examples of kind of the, the perceptual kind of theory that we're investigating. But we're also interested in how we can use this, um, this immersive media. And we're just starting a project now with the psychotherapy clinic here in TU Dresden, uh, where we're investigating how we can use virtual reality to treat anxiety disorders. Um, now, the treatment of anxiety disorders, or the, let's say exposure therapy in virtual reality, ha has a long history, at least 20 or 30 years. Um, so we're a little bit trying to address the question of why, why, what are the problems? Why has it not become mainstream? Um, and we identify one of the problems is it's very difficult to build virtual reality worlds, right? Um, it takes an enormous amount of manpower and time and 3D artists and programmers. So this is certainly... Um, one barrier. And we hope to reduce this by using capture methods, the um, cameras, the scanners, and things like this, with the goal that you can rapidly create a scenario. So rapidly that you might even be able to do it on a per patient basis. This is a second thing we'd like to address. The idea that one treatment would treat all patients or all psychotherapists patient pairs, of course, would never work. Right? If, you, if you told a psychotherapist that they must read a fixed script and never change from the script, they'd say, no, this is not how therapy works. Therapy is a dynamic relationship between the therapist and the patient. So we need the technology to reflect this. And one, one, one way we're doing this is we need to make sure that when someone goes into virtual reality, they are not alone because therapy is a communication. So we're working now with... Um, very much with systems that allow you to bring in your own body into the virtual world. So what you see here are real hands, a real book, but the apartment that we're in is completely virtual, right? And this means that the therapist can go with the patient into the virtual world and they can have natural communication. This is one of the, one of the things we're beginning to work with. And you can see here, for example, we have the classic example of walking on the plank, but now you could actually walk the plank with someone. This is quite extreme example, but um, this is the kind of thing that is, this would make possible. So this is what we're beginning with, and we're very, we very much, uh, we've, we're very enamored with this idea of you never being alone in virtual reality. Um, so over the last two years, we've been doing a lot of work to make sure that we can build multi-user multi, multi -user experiences. These are some experiments where we ran classes inside virtual reality, either from home or in the same place. And we're now building up a system that allows us to use even these very affordable off-the-shelf helmets um, in a kind of a mixed reality, multi-user scenario. So this is some some very recent results from just a, a few weeks ago, where we're able now to, just skip past this technical part, we're able now to all go into the room and we're all able to see the same thing and we're all able to see each other. And on top of that, we're all able to see a mixture between the, the, the physical things, the real things and the virtual world. Um, and we're finding this is transformative. This really helps enormously in all kinds of applications, this kind of thing. Um, and here we see people manipulating and then we make a little bridge to walk across. So that's our goal. And we hope to use the basis of this. We're going to build some, some we're going to use this in the psychotherapy arena, but we also hope to use it in the realm of scientific visualization. And so you can here see, imagine that people are sharing the same virtual world 
they're able to see each other, they're able to communicate naturally, um, and they're able to use large arenas to visualize data. And we're very lucky in our faculty to have a very large foyer in the informatic building. And every time we walk into this foyer, we imagine, hey, this, this could actually be a visualization arena. We could use this as a multi-user kind of data space. We can use all the layers and we can make enormous structures and things like this. So we scan the building and we build a virtual model. This is a photo. This is our virtual model. And now we have an, the capacity to align these things together um, and then introduce into the world virtual elements. And what's fascinating is these, these, head, these head mounted displays, the tracking on them is sufficient that you can walk around, you can walk upstairs, things like this, and it all just works. So you can now use architecture as a way of seeing data. And once you start to see spaces, like once you start to think like this, you see spaces, real spaces quite differently. You start to think, oh, wow, I could use this escalator or I could use these stairs to see virtual things. And so this is our goal. And we've even found, I don't have a video, unfortunately, that you can, because our elevators have glass windows, you can even ride the elevator up and down and you can ride the elevator through virtual, virtual elements. So what we're doing now is bringing this to life. We plan to augment our space with giant structures, abstract forms, and turn our foyer into a form of kind of living data space um, where we can share collectively these, you know, giant abstract presentations or, or even uh, have virtual kind of mixed reality lectures, things like this in the space. Okay. So what I'll do, I think, is I'll conclude there. Um, I hope that was a, that was a very rapid introduction to some of the things we're doing in the lab. Um, I hope not too fast. And um, I believe now, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, we we have time for questions. Um, yes, Mr. McGinnity, thank you so much for your insights into your project. But before you go and uh, we say goodbye, I would like to ask our expert from our university, Professor Dr. Linda Rudd, to come and join us on the stage and ask you the questions. Please, welcome. Thank you, Ellie. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you, hello everyone, and thank you, Matthew, uh, thank you very much for your insights. I, um, it was really um, interesting yeah. to see all the different um, experiments that you're working on right now, and um, the study of immersive systems, as you um, called it. And I love that you reminded us that we shouldn't be thinking too much about the technology, but it's about, you broadened our horizon by reminding us that we could also immerse in environments, even in pre-computer times. Um, Matthew, um, like you said, uh, rightly so, we would like to round this up with a quick um, Q&A session. So I would like to invite everyone in the audience to, um, uh, an to ask some questions, but also in the live stream, if you have any questions, um, coming via YouTube, then please feel free to do so. And I would like to use this opportunity to um, ask you, Matthew, um, the first question, if you're okay with it. Um, I want to know uh, what are the biggest challenges when it comes to your research methods? You showed us some experiments, and I'm sure there's a lot of eye tracking involved, and you showed us some haptical feedback and how you're tracking that. Um, can you elaborate more on the biggest challenges with regards to your research? I would say, actually, one of the biggest challenges we have is very often the things we're trying, we're interested in, are very difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this idea of, or even the very notion of, am I immersed or how immersed am I or how real or something is, is extremely difficult to measure. People more or less have a great difficulty describing their experience. Mm -hmm. Certainly trying to put things into questions with numbers, it's, it's extremely difficult. And so this is actually probably the hardest part, um, 
trying to come up with reliable scientific methods to measure your sense of realness, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and do you do that with a questionnaire right now, or how do you ask about the, the presence? approach is to use questionnaires, and, but we tend to, we find we do one thing is you should ask the questions during the experience. Mm -hmm. and not afterwards, mm -hmm. okay. because remembering these things is very hard. Um, it's like remembering colors. Right? If I ask you what color something was you saw a few minutes ago, you have almost no recollection. Right? I mean, you can say it's red, but if I ask you, is it the same red as this, you would, you would have no way to answer. Right. And we think these experiences are, are like this. Um, but we're kind of more interested to move away from questionnaires if we can, and more to a kind of what we would be called a phenomenological investigation, you know, mm -hmm. where people are encouraged to find their own words. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody have a question for Matthew? I'm trying to see... Yes, yes, sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> Hi, Matthew. Uh, even though you said uh, we must not focus on the technology for itself, I have a technological question. Uh, to scan and align uh, the real world or a real building with uh, the scanned 3D uh, world, how much traditional uh, 3D artistry knowledge or 3D program knowledge is uh, needed or do I need to advance into informatics as well? Uh, it's a very good question. So actually the whole thing has to be built by 3D artists. The, the state of the art with scanning is that you cannot produce um, accurate enough results especially when your building is entirely made of glass and mirrors and things like this. So what we do is we take a scan and we use this as a guide to then rebuild, rebuild it. And to date, we've tried many, many automated methods to go directly from scan and it's still just an unsolved problem. Yeah, um, and how do I align these two worlds, the real world and the, scan, uh, the remodeled world is therefore needed any informatic knowledge? Ah, well, we, we, yeah, we write, we, we wrote a, you can write a little algorithm to do this. Um, it's, but it's not, it's not so complicated and it's, you can find examples online. So essentially we, you, you need at some point to tell the virtual reality system where it is in, in the real world. Um, and we kind of in, we have manual ways where you have to click on a few points. And now we're investigating fully automatic ways so that you don't have to do this. Um, but you can always do it in a manual way, which is you say, this virtual corner here is the same as this real corner here, and then it'll align. Thank you. Okay, so we do have time for one more question, and I see that there is another question. Hello, and thank you very much for that uh, quite interesting presentation. It's uh, impressive what you're doing there. You already mentioned uh, that you work together with psychologists and psychotherapists. In your uh, lab, do you work also um, with other scientists in an interdisciplinary way, like with social scientists or with uh, communication scientists or uh, even with uh, medical doctors? So how, how much interdisciplinarity is there uh, in order to have a comprehensive uh, um, way of, of, of seeing this uh, uh, fascinating aspect? Thank you very much again. Thank you for the question. Um, if, I, if we could, I would make sure every project we did was in, in collaboration with another discipline, um, because this is where the interesting part happens. Uh, we are doing something, we're doing a little experiment with some yeah, cognitive psychologists um, to see if um, systemic therapy, it's called, you know, when you use the little models to, to create systems, systems therapy, it's called, I think. And uh, 
we're recreating that in virtual reality. So that's one example. And we're also beginning to talk with your other example was medical doctors. Uh, we know that we can use these VR training simulations to train nurses or doctors. But again, you have this big problem of creating these simulations. It's really quite difficult. So we're going to look at how we can instead capture and record working doctors, working nurses in their process rather than try to rebuild things by hand. Okay, Matthew, um, thank you again so much for taking time and um, being here with us. Um, maybe we can all let him go with another round of applause. Thank you. And I would like Ellie to come back. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. McGinnity. Thank you, Professor Dr. Linda Rad, um, for being here and for your great session. Um, um, yeah, thank you and good luck into your next project. As you already heard, we have some guys here from Leipzig from the band Zweiersitz. They call their genre neo hippie pop. Between instruments and synthesizers, a surprising musical world with vintage vibes and urban grooves opens up, which is sometimes aesthetically dancing and sometimes lost in thoughts and celebrated. Doesn't it sound fantastic? Well, let's hear what the band has prepared for us. Let me introduce Joke und Micha from Zweiersitz. <laughs> Ich liebe sie und dich, und du liebst ihn und mich. Mensch, Lise, welches Modell ist kompatibel? Ich nehm den Fingerhut, du schickst der Chef auf Reisen. Du willst dich treiben lassen, aber ich brauch Sicherheit. Wir wollen die Regeln nicht kapieren, was wünsch ich mir, was wünschst du dir? Wir filmen, mal gucken, was passiert. Und wie können wir verliebt bleiben? Bei diesen neuen Mietpreisen, diese Spielanleitung ist mir viel zu Standard. Lise lacht, dann spielen wir eben anders. Ich spiel Mono, du spielst Poli. Wir suchen nach Straßen, die es noch nicht gibt. Wir sind nicht verlobt und trotzdem verliebt. Mono. Ich spiel Mono, du spielst Poli. Wir suchen nach Straßen, die es noch nicht gibt. Wir sind nicht verlobt und trotzdem verliebt. Mono Poli. Diese Vorurteile sind ja übel. Bitte, bitte kauf keine Lüge. Wir haben doch Liebe für so vieles. Warum dann nicht für viele? Wir spielen Monopoly. Ich schreibe über uns, weil ich gelesen hab, dass Liebe Kunst sei. Uns unfrei ist irgendwie ungeil. Und dieses Ich liebe nur dich. Ich wusste, was ich mein damit. Aber geglaubt hab ich selber nicht. Dieses Ich liebe nur dich Ich wusste, was ich mein damit Aber geglaubt hab ich selber nicht Du spielst Mono, ich spiel Poli Wir suchen nach Straßen, die's noch nicht gibt Wir sind nicht verlobt und trotzdem verliebt Mono, Poli Du spielst Mono, ich spiel Poli wir suchen nach Straßen, die es noch nicht gibt. Wir sind nicht verloren und trotzdem verliebt. Monopoly. Ich bin Mono, ich so du Mono. Spielst Poli. Du so Wir suchen Poli. nach Straßen, du so die es noch nicht gibt. Ich so Wir sind Poli. nicht verloren, ich so trotzdem Mono. verliebt. Du so Poli. Mono da. Ich bin Mono, ich so Mono. Du spielst Poli. Du so Wir suchen Poli. nach Straßen, du so die es noch nicht gibt. Ich so Poli, ich so Mono, du so Poli, Mono da, Poli, Mono, 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 
Poli. What a great song, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Um, yeah, if I'm not wrong, this is not your first time here in the studio, right? We were here 2015, I guess, when we played at yeah, the our so festival, yeah. Oh, and how does it feel to be here again? It's like coming home to mama. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sweet. Um, I have a very popular question nowadays. Corona, so long, no concerts. How did you use this time? Uh, it was actually not too bad for us because we uh, already planned to write new songs and write an album and we took a year off and wrote a, uh, an album. Then we would have liked to start again, but then we waited another year to <laughs> finally play our tour to the album we released last year. Yeah, sounds great. And maybe you can tell me what is the album about and what it's called? The album is called Seifenblase. Uh, it's like bubble, and it's like uh, it's telling about our social bubbles and how they pop. Oh, cool! I hope that in the summer we will hear this bubble. Are there any events, concerts, or festivals planned? Um, yeah, we are planning to play at your festival if you want to, <laughs> and <laughs> there's also one show in our garden. Uh, you are all invited. And there will be more concerts, uh, you will find them. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy that you're here and I'm very thankful to Urban Tree Music that, help they, that they helped in, uh, to organize it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you too. And so we are continuing with our keynotes. We just learned about the Immersive Experience Lab, where ideas were developed and implemented. But now let us see how visual technologies of immersive media are progressing in our modern and fast-changing media field. Industry 4.0 is growing steadily and is a major user of virtual and augmented reality technologies. These technologies allow operators to acquire critical knowledge in a simple and visual way allowing for more efficient execution of tasks. To get to know more about it, we have invited our next guest, a computer scientist from Potsdam, COO of Fragments. He is mainly concerned with product devel development and programming and works a lot with 3D storytelling. Since 2015, he has placed his professional focus on immersive media and in addition to technology, has dealt with usability, accessibility, interaction design and ethical issues. Now he has been working with Mixed Reality and Industry 4.0 to answer a question about how far companies can utilize mixed realities for improving processes. And he agreed to tell us about it. A big round of applause, please. Stefan Gensch, COO of Fragments. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, it's actually, I just noticed it's the second time I have the pleasure to uh, give my talk right uh, after one of uh, Matthew McGinnity's talks. So I'm both excited and inspired by uh, what he has to say. Um, yeah, my name is Stefan Gensch. I co founded Fragments in uh, 2016. It is an XR company that in the past has dealt a lot with the topics of using immersive tools for journalism. And um, let me just get the presentation started. All right, just a quick, some quick words of myself. I've been introduced already. Um, but yeah, what my main focus or my main consideration is when building tools, it's that people are going to use them. And uh, that should be our main focus every time we use technology to uh, approach and solve um, problems. Uh, with Fragments, yeah, our current goal or what we try to achieve is using immersive technologies 
uh, within the upcoming change of uh, the, the new fourth industrial revolution, which will bring um, a lot of changes to uh, the way we approach problems and uh, also for our society in general. And why we do have a little expertise in, uh, in the topics as shown, uh, here with some examples where we uh, created a uh, health application that allows you to travel inside your lungs and use your hands as kind of um, yep, a tool set to fight um, lung cancer cells uh, and also uh, use it to control yourself inside the body and kind of fly like Superman uh, within the body. Um, the uh, top right part is uh, a screenshot from an experience we built with uh, uh, subway station Stadtmitte in Berlin, which um, was a VR mini game uh, that told you about indoor location, indoor navigation, and um, yeah, also giving uh, uh, insights into uh, how different people would move through a place like that that's not uh, overly accessible, so for example, uh, people that are bound to wheelchair uh, would have to uh, go completely different routes than, than people who can use stairs. Um, we also did a small, uh, nice, or well, not really nice in terms of the content, but uh, uh, it was a wonderful piece in collaboration with uh, Deutschland von Kultur and uh, Jana Wutke, who dug out um, original audio material from um, a, from the last uh, prisoner of uh, the Stasi at that time, and uh, we created, um, a, or we gave viewers the chance to, to witness those talks um, between the interrogator and the interrogatee. And uh, the last uh, part of this slide is an, an actual tool that we built uh, for creating 360 interactive stories. People can just upload content and um, create interactive pieces from that, and Deutsche Welle and Euronews have uh, been contributing to that and uh, have also used it to um, tell quite a lot of stories, and has been funded by the Google DNI uh, at that time. We also do think a lot about how users can actually use immersive content, and we've seen that um, headsets are not overly available uh, all around, and so we thought, okay, what could be like the, the least thing that we can offer to still produce an immersive experience. We said, okay, let's just do a browser and the scroll wheel of a mouse. And that's what we built with a Tagesspiegel. You just scroll and you immerse yourself in an interactive way in the uh, Berlin airport and you can learn a lot about the things that have been going on there. Um, and now we're gradually shifting and, and seeing, okay, we need applications also in uh, industry parts, and uh, that's where we are envisioning something um, we would like to call uh, immersive maintenance management systems, so systems that would allow you with data headsets to go somewhere and do operations there. And we had, starting that project, we had um, a pretty strong vision and we were really keen on, on, on doing something like that, but we noticed there's a lot missing on the way to go there. So to achieve real digital transformation and to achieve yeah, getting real products of value out, uh, we need to do a lot of things uh, before we can do that, and that's just baseline data, digitization, digitalization, and then we can transform these into uh, very cool stuff. So just as a summary, um, I thought a bit about, okay, Industry 4.0, what does that mean? Um, it's basically shifting from a society that is able to turn analog things into digital uh, into a new era of, it's called embedded connectivity, as I've seen in, in some of the resources. Um, also that kind of what our smartphone right now is, it's, it's kind of our, an extension of ourself that has become like that. Um, and that is basically beyond digital. It's, it's really using the digital features and keys to produce more and more uh, things and applications um, on those. And the key themes around Industry 4.0 is that it's a world that's interconnected. Um, digital and analog entities are able to communicate. They do that in a transparent fashion. So uh, 
the, the knowledge that's inherent in the system is available to all the players that have access to that. Uh, it's not just things or knowledge that's internalized uh, within humans. Um, and it has features that assist people in doing their job. And it's, yeah, also decentralized. There's no core entity that basically holds the truth in themselves, but it's available for all the players uh, in that. So those are kind of like the themes we want to go to. And to do that, uh, we have a lot of work uh, um, before us. And uh, just to touch on a few things of, of uh, recent developments, um, just yesterday, I think it was, May the 4th, um, Spectacle, which is uh, one of the um, yep, side products of Snap Inc., uh, has released a video showcasing what their new smart glasses can do. And it's pretty amazing. So there um, are quite a few applications in, in retail and entertainment uh, that focus on, okay, we augment or yeah, we augment basically the real world uh, with interconnected people that can join together in experiences and, yeah, just enjoy digital content that's not just superimposed, but it feels really integrated into the real world. And to do that, we have a lot of disciplines that also come together. So one of the last uh, advances in capturing the real world uh, was another post that I found and thought that was interesting. And I also like the question about uh, the challenges of really how do we capture what's real. Uh, and then we need uh, people to understand and, and be able to also use the devices that are, are given to us because with uh, immersive technologies, we have a change in interfaces. We even have interfaces that are not there, that are just virtual uh, displayed in front of us, and we still have to interact with them in, in some fashion through gestures, through maybe still touching close points in, in, in the air, and still getting some sort of feedback, so there's a lot of design going on. Uh, and Dennis Kuhner is actually one of the guys uh, I follow that uh, does very impressive work and he's a constant output, almost daily, uh, new experiments, and I find that very uh, inspirational. So, talking about applications, where do we want to go? Um, in automotive, it's uh, already starting to being used uh, for collaborative design, design reviews, uh, virtual showrooms, so using that even in retail, that Customers, people can go there and see a car that they want to uh, buy in reality in front of them. They can walk around, uh, try different things. So it's basically uh, the yeah from the 90s the configurator DVD on steroids. Um, and but there's also for the people working there in the production chains, there are tools, uh, guides, um, hands-on training, so people can do on-the-job training with uh, virtual assistants. Uh, yeah, which gives um, yeah, onboarding a, a, a quick route to, to become an experienced uh, um, co-worker in that. Architecture, engineering, and construction is one of the main drivers, actually, for um, Industry 4.0 mixed reality applications because it's been done for quite a while, and a lot of that um, foundational work, um, the digitization has already happened for a long time. So. Uh, 3D CAD applications are um, yeah, just super common from planning uh, through construction. And now it's kind of um, the, the main challenge is how do we uh, get the digital uh, towards the analog and the real world when, when constructing it and building it. And uh, yeah, there are tons of, of, of tools and players right now that are trying to uh, work in that field and advance health. Um, we have seen some examples in uh, um, yeah, assistance or health therapy. Um, Matthew has talked, for example, about um, uh, apps that help you um, encounter certain situations. Um, but there's also for, um, for people that work in medicine uh, that want to do training, there can be assisted surgery. So uh, the real body that's being worked on can be superimposed with... Um, digital uh, data, uh, MRT scans, for example, that are volumetric, that can be dissected and with certain tools viewed, so experts uh, do not only have uh, access to 2D material when, when viewing um, yeah, the condition of a patient, but they can really uh, go beyond and dig deeper. 
in agriculture, and, and uh, I think this is one of the examples where the real world is quite strong, um, and the, um, the, the digital is not uh, yet super visible, but in the end you'll have a lot of um, things in, in such a system that produce data, and you have a, um, a large need to produce something meaningful from that data because you need analytics uh, on the status of the plants, on the light, uh, on all the energy consumption of the whole system, the water, uh, and you need to automate um, the, yeah, basically giving back to the, to the system. Uh, and as such, this is a not so super visual uh, element of uh, um, mixed reality in the industry, um, but the complexity is, is kind of like uh, the same level. And in retail, um, Maybe some of you have already used the AR functionality when uh, either viewing products or when trying to place them, for example, in, in your home. And yeah, a lot of retailers make use of that technology and place artifacts in your room so you can um, try them out. Um, there's a lot to be done in order to actually bring these applications that at the surface look quite tiny and small and easy. Um, but you need a lot to, to um, actually build those things. And when starting out on a project, the main thing or the main focus I would recommend is really pinpointing the problems you want to solve and, and really defining well uh, the target group that you're building um, stuff for. So, for example, it could be a decision-making tool or it could be a training tool or it could be something in production that helps people better achieve their jobs. Then... The things you have to do, you have to check, okay, what are all the artifacts I would need for such a, uh, a tool? And then you need to check the digitization chain. Okay, can I produce everything that's analog? How can I best get the digital versions of that? What else is needed? What, what, else, what other data do I need? What processes do I want to run on? And yeah, basically building from the data into there. And AI and computer vision is also a tool set that can be employed. Um, I would say it can reduce a lot of work that needs to be done when, for example, capturing and cleaning data. Um, we have to know that a lot of those algorithms produce something that is statistically what we want, but it might not be exactly what we want. So we have to be careful when employing these uh, methods. Digitalization, so everything making use of that data, transforming it, is uh, the next key element um, in the process chain. And um, yeah, there's vast opportunities for, for people um, to go in there and provide uh, solutions for that, from um, transforming the data into, into meaningful and useful um, versions to um, getting data from A to B, uh, building applications that can handle these amounts of data, exchange them meaningfully, and present all that, what's in the system, in a meaningful way um, to the end users. So the visualization component is also uh, a key factor in that. And uh, I would say, since these projects are, can be so large and complex, it's really about gradually implementing them and really planning very well uh, what the assignment is going to be and how the, um, yeah, really assessing the problem uh, that's going to be um, solved and uh, also, for example, for creative work and collaboration that you say, okay, these are the steps that I need and uh, also providing a simulation in, in, in some forms to uh, check if my process and my approach is still valid. The challenges for um, using XR in uh, small and medium enterprises are vast because, as I said, I touched uh, on, on quite a few points that are um, necessary to get XR running uh, in, in your projects. And on the content uh, sphere, we already have um, the challenges of uh, getting the meaningful data and storing it and, um, yeah, basically procuring it to the systems that want to make use of them. And this has to be also a, a constant flow. It's not that we once create data 
and then we're done. We need to establish mechanisms to permanently capture um, real-world data and be able to provide a digital variant of that. Um, and of course, exchanging that um, just uh, for a, a short scene in a volumetric capture studio, it can provide uh, tons of gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes of data. And in, in some forms, in the end, you'll just have maybe a tiny 3D model that's being animated and looks real. But uh, during the capture process, just this small piece is going to be an enormous amount of data that needs to be managed and reduced to produce the final output. So uh, within that, there's um, yeah, a vast challenge. Um, and also some studios, uh, like I think in Potsdam, you've visited VolueCap. They are, for example, tackling those um, difficult questions. Um, then there's the display uh, of content in XR, and that's both um, the uh, visual as well as the um, representation or the access of, of the information within the app. So we also talk about the user interfaces and the user experience that, um, that is created uh, with the content and around the content. Um, and that is challenging because even though um, XR applications are pretty much um, mocking the real world, so it's, it's best approaching it really hands-on uh, in space because it's a spatial uh, application and, and you, you're going to use it in space just like you would use it in the real world. We are with technical interfaces, they have been 2D for uh, three, four decades and we're still used to putting buttons everywhere to express something that we want to do, and we want to press that button. And that's just not working ideally in XR. So also in that, there is um, yeah, the accessibility um, question that will then, in the end, create a great usability if done right. Um, some of the current solutions uh, for XR in the industry, uh, Unity Reflect, there are... Um, able to, to take uh, CAD data from um, meaningful tools and offering them to view collaboratively on uh, different media. So you can view it in AR on a smartphone, or you can just uh, have it in 3D on a system, on a desktop, or a, a tablet. Or you can even view it in mixed reality or in VR. And uh, they offer quite a, a an extensive tool set that can be um, the right experts um, yeah, built upon and, and, and can be used. And it's pretty fascinating. And Vidya Omniverse, they are um, doing a similar approach. One of their advantages is that they offer server-side rendering. That means that a lot of the computational stuff they do at a data center, and you just stream the experience to the smartphone with the promise of achieving a lot of higher fidelity than would be possible just on a device. So basically, there's a constant communication stream. If I rotate the smartphone in our application, it would send that data, that rotational positional data, to the server. And that would quickly uh, calculate the renders, return the imagery to the smartphone, and then would, it would display that. With the advantage of that the smartphone, besides the communication, doesn't have to calculate that. Um, and can operate longer on battery power. Uh, Speckle Systems is doing similar stuff. Uh, they are actually open source, so you can host your own uh, versions of that, and I find that quite interesting. Um, because thanks to the AEC industry, there's been a lot of standardization already in that area, uh, which is good, and open source communities can profit from that because they can also build on these standards. Um, yeah, and to conclude, Digital Water City is one of the projects we're in. Uh, I had talked about the uh, digital well diary, so our ultimate vision in a couple of years is actually being able to provide every drinking water well in a digital twin and, and run um, yeah, maintenance operations on, uh, on smart glass. And um, thank you. fields. Um, I find it very interesting and I would like to ask you a question. What exactly sparked your interest in virtual and mixed realities? 
um, it has been actually a very particular event. Uh, it's been the Basteltage at uh, a data journalist uh, Lorenz Matzat's uh, offices uh, at that time in Berlin, where I saw the Oculus DK1 or 2 for the first time, and I said I want to try building some stuff, and he gave me the opportunity to uh, yeah, actually build some experiences and do some experiments, and that's when I said, okay, I want to make a living from that. So, uh, get interested through, so, uh, through doing it. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you so much, and we will see you later in our Q&A. But for now, big round of applause, please. <laughs> Stefan Gensch. Thank you. Yes, uh, wonderful. But through the immersive week, between our guest students, uh, we met a rising star, Yvonne Mas. She comes from Romania. And one month ago, she released a new song called Ignore You. I'm very excited to hear it here in the same studio. Please welcome and big applause, Yvonne. <laughs> song, very deep song. Um, I have a question. What were you thinking about while you were writing it? Well, it's about a fear, like, you know, that small uh, voice in your head that, you, that, are t that is telling you, um, okay, do that, and do that, and uh, yeah, it's uh, like a fear, like, I want that fear to come closer, but uh, I ignore it so can go forward. Mm -hmm. So, 
and that's about it. <laughs> oh yeah, really interesting. Um, how long are you performing and writing songs? Because this one was really great. Thank you. Uh, for like a an year and or a an year and a half like this. Really? <laughs> yeah. Only a year? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> then what are your plans for the big uh, music industry? I would love to go worldwide. This worldwide. is my dream. <laughs> worldwide. Well, that's a very powerful world. Um, thank you. Uh, I have actually one last question, not related to music. Well, maybe. Um, but what did you like the most uh, about this immersive week? Oh, it was amazing. I had a really nice experience uh, with a VR project, and I can't wait for more of them. <laughs> Oh, sounds so good. Um, yeah, well, I wish you luck in the future. Thank you. I hope we will hear from you, right? <laughs> okay, but for now, thank you so, so thank much. You. And big applause, everyone. Yvonne. As now we have got a little insight into the virtual world, we would like to continue with something similar, but concentrate more on the media field, meaning a study on virtual reality films. We have invited a guest from Austria, who works mostly on the development of new film formats, design and communication, media and moving images. She is a lecturer and works in the St. Paulson University of Applied Sciences, Department of Media and Digital Technologies. She is here this evening to tell about her study in 360 degrees of storytelling and has been doing research that, that examines the presence of people in virtual reality films, for example, by measuring heartbeats. Furthermore, she is here and will talk about it. Let's welcome with warm applause Professor Dr. Rosa von Süß from the St. Paul University, University of Applied Sciences. Please come on stage. Yeah. Thank you very much for this great introduction. I have my notes with me because the research is really fresh. So we um, finished the paper yesterday. Thank you for the uh, whole week, Christoph. Thank you for the invitation, Linda. And thank you, students, that you work so, uh, so good in producing films. We will see tomorrow the films. Uh, we leave them alone. Um, now I'm talking about uh, my ongoing research project on immersive video interaction that investigates cinematic virtual reality to gain a better understanding for narrative-based interaction. Uh, we rewrite the scripts and feeding back the films to flowcharts. And furthermore, we explore presence, as Matthew mentioned before. It's a very interesting and complex thing that is necessary in um, immersive media. And um, we used biometric da data considering the influence of interaction. And our investigation addresses selected cinematic VR. Here you can see a cube map um, on this chart. Yeah, this is a cube map uh, still. Um, so we um, investigated VR films from the entertainment industry available on customer VR platforms and film festivals. And they should have an interactive structure where the user can choose between different story 
lines and it should have 360 real video VR and the genre should be fiction. Over a period of three months, we collected VR projects, VR video, VR real video, VR interactive, VR linear, a lot of words we found. And we make long lists and categorize, uh, categorized a lot. Our findings uh, from 74 VR films show us about that sample that the typical VR film is less than 20 minutes. The main interaction method is gaze control. The role of the user is mainly an observer. The students heard about that in the lectures. Um, the language is English. This is not surprising because uh, over 80% of the VR films are produced in the USA. And the terms about the VR films, cinematic films, are very indistinct. We have mostly uh, 360 degree video. Um, then we have VR film, immersive or linear, cinematic VR experience. Yeah, this is, uh, I'm a little bit uh, slow with the charts here. And in the scientific references, we found a name for that we are looking for, Rias proposed a solution with the term interactive fiction in cinematic virtual reality in 2018. And that stands for interactive digital narrative VR experience based on 360 degree video narrative with an interactive structure. The industry do not use that term. But we now know we, there are words for what we are looking for. Um, it was necessary that uh, the user can choose between different existing storylines. And from the generated catalog, only three projects that fit the criteria remained for further study. The research was uh, in 2000, the collection was 2019 and 20. So maybe now we have more, but not very much. So here's an example, uh, Broken Night by Benari, 2017, tells the story of a couple who arrives at home and starts to fight, they get interrupted by an intruder that is killed in the end. The perspective is from a police interview after the event and later in the story, the user takes on the wife's point of view in, at the police station. This is only one. There are only choices between two options. And the choices appear uh, as a split screen that shows how the scene play out after choosing. The user can choose uh, the scene with gaze and um, the cinematic VR offers four intermittent choices between two options. And the user is act mainly as an active observant, and the story is set up in five different locations. Let's have a look how these um, 
choices are working at the beginning. Yeah, can you start the video? Mm -hmm. It's not working from here. So this is the start of the video, Broken Heart. Um, this is the uh, exposition to learn how the interaction is working. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, these three films have in common that the user decides between different story branches how the story contains and two cases with visual cues. Uh, this is Broken Night and Playing God. And in one case, only with the hint that there is, there are decisions with gaze control, but you don't have a visual cue. So you, you know you interact, and, and, uh, but you don't know when. So the afterlife, uses non-visible gaze control, only a few interactive parts that they require the user with a controller. Yeah, and uh, in the all of the evaluated IFCVR, we found different complexities of story structures, but all appear to be trees, the length of the um, interactive fiction, cinematic, virtual reality are uh, 10 or uh, 10 to uh, 45. The number of choices in each decision is similar, it's one, two, three. Uh, they share gaze control as a primarily technical interaction method. So the, he is similar to the catalog. Yeah, when uh, applying this information about the role of the user to the concept conducted by Dolan and Parrot and updated by Dolan and Bai in 2016, it can be visualized as seen here, the role of the user is different in each um, case we conducted. The three IFCVR confirm that the role of the user can be sorted in that grid. That was a reference in the, uh, we found that it should be, f every role should be in that grid. So, as mentioned before, presence is a rather complex construct of variety of dimensions. And Slater described presence as a subjective state of feeling, including the notion of being there. Um, to measure presence, we used a mixed method approach. Um, with user tests and questionnaires and um, biometric data. The relevant factors in presence always are spatial presence, the feeling I'm in the room, the room is realistic, engagement, I can interact, I can uh, participate, I am in the story, and naturalness, how real is the environment. Emotion and simula simulation triggers changes in skin conductance with 
resolves in GSR peaks. So at as a first step in the user test, biofeedback data of the test users were recorded while they were experienced the interactive fiction. So we could observe exactly while using the interaction points if there is uh, emotional simulation. Then presence was measured by quote using a proven questionnaire. Matthew mentioned that there are uh, psychological tests that are used to measure presence. But we don't want, don't want only, not only use the questionnaire because this is after the experience. So we want it to combine. In the next step, the biofeedback data and the semi-structured questions were used as a basis for a qualita qualitative interview with the test user. In the last phase, the acquired data from the questionnaire, the biofeedback data, and the semi-structured interview was evaluated evaluated. The results of the questionnaire were analyzed by quote. The qualitative interviews were transcribed. It was a long work. We had 55 user uh, tests and each interview was 50 minutes. And um, the, then we coded on the base of our references, because there is a lot of research on presence, um, for example, the mentioned Slater and others. And then we build a category system and um, categories uh, categorized the uh, explanations of the test users from the interview. Uh, the evaluation of the skin conductan uh, conductance data showed that in addition of other factor, uh, factors uh, that trigger peaks like plot, story, camera work, sound, uh, we could found peaks at every decision points. When the user know now is a decision, we have a peak. So if they make actively a uh, decision. Here you can see the peaks heart rate, as me mentioned before, we didn't use the data because um, it was very sensible on the movement of the test user, so we uh, excluded that. And facial control, we excluded that for um, data because of the head-mounted display. It's difficult to only have the mouse. Okay, now this is uh, the evaluation. And we can see in all uh, interactive fiction films, we can see a spatial presence uh, out of the questionnaire. And with the interviews, we uh, got the, um, the explanations of the users. They are in the room. So Spatial presence works in every film. Uh, neither the role of the user nor the number of the interaction points show differences on spatial presence. So there is nothing to say for that. What is with naturalness? 
naturalness was notable lower in uh, one of the investigated interactive fiction um, and that featured an unrealistic environment as indicated by most of the test users from the interviews. For the presence factor naturalness, two work uh, projects showed a lower number of interaction points with visual interaction cues and have a comparable high score and most significant difference from the interactive fiction cinematic VR with a high number of interaction points with visual cues. <laughs> Very complex, but that suggests that interaction points with visual interaction cues reduce presence. This is interesting because the skin conductance show if you have interaction, there is a arousal. So engagement, this is the last um, factor. And with the most active role of the user, where the user is a character, this is the most active role. Um, that scores the lowest on the factor of engagement. This is interesting, but yeah, the, the um, even through the clear interaction methods and the high number of interaction points were assumed to increase engagement. So it's not, uh, you don't need a lot of interaction points, naturalness is much more important. The two uh, works with the highest scores in naturalness and engagement have different roles of users from active observer to passive character, as well as different numbers in interaction points. So what can we say? We can say first, an active role of the user and consciousness a decision about the story progress have an emotional arousal. Second, presence is in all the um, uh, in all the pro project shown. That means production knowledge now is aware how to uh, build up spatial presence because it's scored high in all the three projects. And the different amount of interaction points and the role of the user has a minor impact on presence. Um, the research show then that uh, the technical interaction method is relevant because interaction points with visual cue reduce presence. Yeah, thank you very much. For uh, this was it for today. There are other data we can evaluate because uh, we had this three method approach. Uh, this is a team at the University of Applied Science in St. Pölten, and we are guests here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor for sharing your interesting results and your experience. Um, I have one question for you as well. Um, what is the most inspected outcome of your study? Yeah, that uh, the amount of interaction yeah, points is not so important than the naturalness. This is for me really surprising 
because interactive fiction uh, should be, uh, the participation should be high if I have a lot of interaction points. And uh, another thing is that the people, the test users, um, mentioned that the one story was out visual cue at the interaction point, that they didn't know how to interact, but this work sc uh, scored higher than the others with the visual cue. That means I think that uh, further production maybe has story worlds where you can interact, but you don't know. You don't say here, click, or uh, gaze control. You, you want to explore this word. Maybe, oh. yeah. Yeah, speak it with you. Mm -hmm. And when, when we think of uh, three-dimensional metaverse, then maybe, yeah, this is a thing that I'm interact, but maybe without knowing which room I'm entering. I'm just trying. It's more fun. Yeah, but there are a lot of small findings we got. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was very detailed. Thank you for your answer. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, really, thank you. And we will see you in the following Q&A. So, but for now, yeah, applause, please. Uh, thank you. Professor Rosa Penzus. Yeah, you can thank you. It. Thank you. Um, but before the Q&A with our speakers, let's hear one more song from our band, Zweijazitz. <laughs> Irgendwo, nirgendwo, wir leben irgendwo, nirgendwo. Irgendwo, nirgendwo, irgendwo. Du suchst eine Wohnung in Berlin und ich immer noch nach dem Sinn. Ich find's hier irgendwie ganz schön und mach mir morgens einen Gin. Ich zieh Tomaten im Garten meiner 3 Hektar WG. Du ziehst dich Karten auf dem Abend in der Sonnenallee. Du kennst deinen Nachbarn nicht, aber denkst, sie sei nett. Mein Nachbar bringt mir manchmal Kaffee ans Bett. Zum 12 Euro der Quadratmeter. Die Stadt ist doch korrupt. Dich nerven Minuten. Wir warten hier Tage auf den Bus. Und unser Pferd springt nicht viel höher als es muss. Und unser Haus ist tausendmal geiler. Geiler als alle deine Clubs. Irgendwo und nirgendwo. Wir leben irgendwo und nirgendwo. Falls sie uns sucht, wir sind irgendwo. Irgendwo und nirgendwo. Ja, wir glauben, es ist besser so. Besser so irgendwo und nirgendwo. Falls sie uns sucht, wir sind irgendwo. Irgendwo und nirgendwo. Ihr habt Gangster, wir haben Dorfkids, ihr habt Laternen an, wir sehen bis in den Norbit. In deinem Schlafzimmer kommt die Tram vorbei, auf dem Hof hier gegenüber fährt ein Quart im Kreis. Dieses Haus macht uns zu dem, was wir sind, endlich macht es Leben und Sinn. Dieses Haus macht uns zu dem, was wir sind, endlich macht es Leben und Sinn. Und zwölf Euro der Quadratmeter, die Stadt ist doch kurz. Dich nerven Minuten, wir warten hier Tage auf den Bus. Und unser Pferd springt nicht viel höher als es muss. Und 
Und unser Haus ist tausendmal geiler Geiler als alle deine Clubs Irgendwo, nirgendwo Wir leben irgendwo, nirgendwo Falls sie uns sucht, wir sind irgendwo Irgendwo, nirgendwo ja, Wir glauben, es ist besser so Besser so irgendwo, nirgendwo Falls sie uns sucht, wir sind irgendwo Irgendwo, nirgendwo ich zieh zum Magen im Garten meiner 3 Hektar WG Du ziehst euch Karten auf den Abend in der Sonnenallee Du kennst deine Nachbarn nicht, aber denkst sie sei nett Mein Nachbar bringt mir manchmal Kaffee ins Bett Ich zieh zum Magen im Garten meiner 3 Hektar WG Du ziehst euch Karten auf den Abend in der Sonnenallee Du kennst deine Nachbarn nicht, aber denkst sie sei nett Mein Nachbar bringt mir manchmal Kaffee ins Bett Dankeschön. Thank you guys so much for the entertainment. There are certainly many students among us who like to deal with modern journalism themselves and are looking for the most attractive way to tell a story. That's why we are now looking forward together with Stefan and Rosa and our host, expert, Professor Dr. Linda Rath from the Midweider University of Applied Sciences from the Journalism Department to discuss modern storytelling in line with innovative concepts. Yes, and you all are welcome here to prepare your questions in the audience and in, in our live stream because soon you will have the chance to ask those our speakers. But now, Please, Professor Dr. Linda Ran, come onto the stage and take a seat. Thank you very much. And please, Stefan Gensch, please join her. <laughs> Professor Rosa, <laughs> please. Um, yeah, and then the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, this is another Q&A session, so I would like to ask the studio audience to um, ask as many questions as possible. And also the audience in the live stream, you're more than welcome to ask as many questions as possible. Stefan and Rosa, thank you so much for um, uh, giving us more insights about your um, projects uh, that you work on and um, the business that you established. Uh, full disclosure, we um, co-founded Fragments together, so I'm very well aware of the projects that you're working on. Um, again, I would like to take the opportunity to ask the first question, and I would like to start with Rosa. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about um, the production knowledge um, at, at the end um, of, of the summary. And I was wondering, how does the future of 360 production look like, based on your findings? Yeah, uh, the of 360 degree video, maybe we don't need that. <laughs> uh, maybe we get uh, other words. It's more than, uh, you don't need 360 or 180, for example. So is that very similar to what Matthew said at the beginning, that immersion doesn't need a lot of technology? You, you get that feeling of immersion um, with a panoramic view of something? Well, that uh, Matthew meant other things, I guess. Uh, he wanted to put uh, other topics to talk about and not only about high resolution or n the next new camera. So this is not the importance. The importance is uh, uh, do we need interactive fiction or do we have interact uh, uh, environment in the internet? I guess uh, the interactive fiction film, maybe it's a uh, state between, but it shows uh, interesting uh, um, facts for the uh, um, new uh, environments at the internet where I can interact with uh, uh, people. You have a project. 
Now this was Matthew, this uh, interplay in groups, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And um, you can, if you can map the environment and change it, mm -hmm. you don't need the film. You can go into the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you have interaction there too. You need naturalness. You need engagement mm -hmm. and spatial pre uh, presence. Mm -hmm. um, Stefan, you mentioned mixed reality applications in different um, industries, including automobile industry, health, and agriculture. And what we're all interested in, I guess, is um, can you think of mixed reality applications? Um, devoted to journalism or media production in general? Um, absolutely. So f for once, I think there's still a valid um, term in, in, in producing um, end user content, uh, but also in the journalistic work of research and verification, I see a lot of potential because you, with uh, mixed reality technologies, uh, capturing mm. real places, modeling, uh, you get the opportunities to recreate places and events and be able to run verification on uh, environments, uh, plausibility, is, are certain things visible from a certain position? Uh, could people have heard something from being in, in a certain place uh, and, and observe stuff? And I think, um, yeah, the tools are there mm -hmm. and they just need to be exploited. And, uh, for example, uh, forensics uh, architecture is... a uh, a London-based agency that is doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us more about the skills that you specifically need for not only creating the applications, but also um, producing for a wider um, audience within the, eco within the mixed reality ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's for once the content creation side of it, um, being able to, um, yeah, generate what's actually appearing in 3D in the application uh, from either 3D modeling by hand or um, yeah, using photogrammetry, videogrammetry methods to produce um, yeah, or to produce point clouds uh, similar to what Volucap is basically doing. Uh, static captures or even motion captures in, in that case, which is highly interesting. But then still you have to clean that data um, as um, Matthew explained. Uh, we've done that in one of our projects uh, too with uh, uh, the August Macke um, mm -hmm. studio where we had a, um, a capture but the model itself was so coarse that we could just use it as a mold and then our 3D artist has basically created a, a cleaner version of it that was then um, in, the, in the final application. Um, yeah. So content and then of course story. Story, story design, everything in there. Yeah, I think that's what we've been doing over the past um, days. We've been creating 360 projects, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the outcome uh, tomorrow. <laughs> um, I've heard some great feedback so far, but I'm, I, I haven't seen uh, that many yet. So um, do we have any questions for our speakers? Yes, up there is someone. Ms. Professor Rosa, uh, I'd like to stick on the question of Ms. Professor Grat, and uh, I'd like to ask something. Um, I think we both agree when I say uh, we have to minimize the sensoric and the devices you have to wear on your body when you get in the VR, so you don't get just an immersive experience but a realistic ex experience. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about um, systems like Hyperbol in Munich? And did you think this is a possible way for customers to get in this VR in maybe a few months, years? Well, Hyperbol is a volumetric studio, or can you explain Hyperbol? I don't know. I don't yeah, know Hyperbol is a VR studio where you can create um, for example, movie films and uh, advertisements. Yeah, yeah. The, you mentioned virtual production and the 3D modeling, this in-camera production. So this is uh, clearly 
the future. <laughs> yeah. It is clearly, yeah. That was that what I meant before. And you have been in Berlin at the Volumetric Studio. You can change the set design. You can even put the character inside. This is this is uh, the future of film production. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is another question over here. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation, bo both Stefan and Rosa. I think that it's very important to see how this technology is being used because this is, at the end, what we uh, expect. I um, also found your research, Rosa, impressive because uh, there is not so much research done in this yeah. area and mm -hmm. really congratulations. And I heard something um, during this uh, session also from uh, Matthew, our um, computer scientist and from yourself um, um, regarding the measurements that um, those kind of um, after uh, stimuli measurements like uh, questionnaire surveys mm -hmm. to measure the immersiveness or to measure the realness, which are two important characteristics of this kind of videos. It's, it's not suitable to do this, like ask after. And I would like to ask your opinion to, 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 to all the people, uh, to all our presenters, um, how can we do it differently? I mean, could there be a possibility, for instance, to visualize the movie and in the movie to get this kind of, yeah, it's that real and to sort of click, with, to, to, to make a sign with your eyes and then you can measure in the stimuli or how do you, how do you suggest to measure it differently and why is this kind of questionnaire not, uh, not okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the point is why, why do we need uh, to measure the arousal. We, we want to know, do the users feel in the VR room? And is the reality relevant to act? Or does the test user always think, ah, now I can put this, no, no, where are my legs? And so, as, as the people mentioned in the questionnaires and in the interviews, they were always tr uh, find out how does that work. Maybe, so we, d we did an observation uh, during the, the uh, experience with video and with the measurement. But I think the most important thing is that the people can describe it. Maybe focus groups are very good. Why not? And you can um, record what they are talking. Maybe they should talk while they uh, are in the experience, as we know from gamers. <laughs> But are there no other measurements like, I don't know, like a scale out of mm, three, four, five questions that should then allow us to do a more precisely me a measurement? So nobody developed something like this yet in yeah. the science? No, that that there, was my question. There's a lot of development and a lot of uh, companies want to sell their measuring tools to measure presence. They are really expensive. We used uh, iMotion. You don't, it's kind of black box. You don't know what is inside and get out the data. And then they say, aha, uh -huh, here's the arousal, here's the heart rate. So, yeah, there are a lot of tools. They are expensive. Even the questionnaire we used is a proven questionnaire, which uh, can exactly measure. Uh, presence in these three dimensions. Yeah. Wow. But nothing else. Do you know, uh, uh, do you have an idea? Um, yes, we have worked uh, with uh, using our 360 platform uh, with Thomas Seymat. Uh, he was uh, head of immersive uh, at Euronews. 
-hmm. And he, um, what was the university he was at? It was... University of Missouri. Missouri, Missouri, yeah. And they did, uh, they conducted uh, some user experience tests where they created uh, an application and put the feedback right into the application where you could choose, okay, this made me feel dizzy or how was the degree of yeah. whatever in that concrete 360 scene. So it was consuming, it was a short portion and right away uh, requesting it. Um, and then the technology itself uh, has a lot of opportunities to capture user metrics on the fly. Uh, we can measure the exact milliseconds, uh, how long it takes to do an interaction, how, how easily and how quickly can users reach certain goals mm -hmm. within an application. So when we think even within 360, this can become a really a big amount of, of, of research data we can, we can use. Uh, and then in interactive, three-dimensional spatial applications even more that are more like games. Uh, and this is also treated as an, an ethical problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, the, the, both the researchers from the University of Mainz, can you help me out on that one? But there's like that one <laughs> uh, um, paper on um, ethics in VR, and they already talk about uh, that we that every user in a, in a VR application has their own footprint. So the mm -hmm. shaking of the head, um, certain uh, way they move and walk, they're going to be detectable and identifiable. So it's, uh, it's um, yeah, even a, a, a loophole for extracting user data from there. And of course, that can be used for good, for testing, for analysis of uh, the efficacy of uh, experiences, but it can also be a problem. That sounds very dystopian, <laughs> a little bit be. at least. <laughs> um, uh, I want to check if there are any questions, Michelle, via the live stream. Do we have any questions from the audience on YouTube? Um, yes, we have one to Stefan Gensch. What do you think? Could those virtual showrooms in the automobile branche, which you showed in your presentation, um, established or is it too expensive? It's going to be a moment where uh, the devices that we uh, show the content on become uh, more and more available. So for once for AR, we have the devices. Um, smartphones are basically ubiquitous and most of them are AR capable. So um, it's just up to the uh, producers to construct a model, construct an experience and give you it give you the opportunity to walk around, configure the car, and, and experience it. It doesn't have to be full-scale VR or mixed reality. Um, and anything else, so I think Spectacle is really making tremendous uh, moves. Magic Leap will announce mm -hmm. its uh, second version uh, soonish or later, I don't know. And I, I absolutely don't care because it's going to be, I guess, maybe two generations of devices, maybe three. Um, and I'm not sure if we have seen the iPhone equivalent yet. Um, Apple is still expected to produce something in the near future. They put their projects, uh, I think, on hold for a while now. So uh, we'll see what's coming there. And um, I guess as soon as the first Apple product is going to be out, I guess the underlying technology or the work done before has been uh, enough for Apple to decide, okay, now it's time to build something that users will accept. So I think it's coming. Okay, so unfortunately we're running out of time. I would like to end this Q&A with one last question to both of you. Um, because we're um, in this immersive week, maybe you both have um, advice to our students, um, because I'm sure that some of them, maybe even most of them, are going to want to um, continue working in that space. Maybe you can start, Rosa, yes. Try. <laughs> yes, I think experimenting, I, I've, I hear that a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. I think experimenting is the number one key to I was just going to say as well, quantity <laughs> over quality at the moment. Try, 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 try out things that are uh, supposed to be not working. Brute force the stuff, experiment. Um, 
I once made an error in a VR application that made me constantly turn around and I had that Baumgartner experience basically when he was falling off the sky and <laughs> tumbling and I thought, okay, it should make me sick, but it was actually quite interesting. So um, even mistakes can bring up uh, cool results. Well, thank you so much um, for the presentations and the Q&A. And um, thank you to the studio audience for asking the questions and to the live audience. Um, I'll give it back to Ellie and Elisa. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Dr. Lindera, for the management. And thanks to Stefan Gensch and Professor Franzus for being uh, here with us today and sharing your insights of your work. Thank you. That was our talk today. We hoped you liked the insights you could get from all our experts who joined us. Yes, and latest trends and interesting introduction. Take all with you. And we will see you on 23rd and 24th of November here in the same studio because we will experience Meet and Forum 2022 with various panels, workshops, meet and greet, and recruiting launch here. And that, and that is all organized by our team. Let us introduce ourselves. Come, Come our on stage. Team. Come on our stage. <laughs> so, yes, uh, Lucy and Laurin, heads of Team Congress. <laughs> Natalie, Head of Organization. Jonathan, Head of the Team Finance. <laughs> and Michelle and Simon, Heads of Team Communication. And we are looking forward to welcoming the best speakers and companies on site in November. But also, if you have any fantastic ideas who you'd like to see on stage or who you'd like to chat with at the meet and greet, send us a mes message on Instagram or comment here in the YouTube live stream. We would be very happy to read your ideas. Yes, uh, thanks again to our guests, to our singer, to our band, and of course, you, our audience. Have a nice evening, and we will see you on 23rd and 24th of November. 2022. Zweiersitz wirklich echt? Ich glaube nicht. Nein? Ist das echt? Welches Modell ist kompatibel? Ich nehm den Fingerhut, du schickst das Schiff auf Reisen. Du willst dich treiben lassen, aber ich brauch Sicherheit. Wir wollen die Regeln nicht kapieren, was wünsch ich mir, was wünschst du dir? Wir mal gucken, was passiert. Und wie können wir verliebt bleiben?